Good morning, Good Shepherd, and welcome to church this morning. Let's take a moment to just center our hearts. We do this by taking a posture this morning, a physical posture that kind of reflects where your heart and your mind is at this morning. So maybe that's bowing your head, closing your eyes. Maybe it's putting your hands out in front of you or over your heart. Whatever you want to do to say, here I am. And this morning we breathe in deep and we exhale about twice as long. We breathe in God's kindness and we exhale a sense of fear. We breathe in God's mercy and we exhale all anxiety. God has brought you here, so pour out your heart. Let it be filled with the peace and wonder of God. This morning, let us come together and sing. Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, 
Therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not thy compassion. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join. Let's say our generosity liturgy together. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. 
We desire to be rich in good deeds and willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. May it be true of our community. Amen. Well, this morning, uh, we are so glad that you're here with us. If you're by yourself, know that you're not alone. Why not at this time speak grace and peace to either your roommates or your family members or else send a text to someone or give them a call and speak grace and peace. Send that prayer of blessing this morning. Grace and peace to you. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 32, the road to Emmaus. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he that was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he spoke to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself." Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Thirty-three days. That is how long my friend Laura has been fighting for her life on a ventilator in intensive care. Laura fled the city for her parents' home in Massachusetts some six weeks ago out of fear of contracting the coronavirus. It found her anyway. And days after her first symptoms arrived, Laura was sedated. She was placed on a ventilator, and that is where she is until today, fighting for her life. She is 31 years old. All across New York City, there are others drowning in oceans of grief. My friend John is a pastor on Staten Island. He just conducted a funeral for one of the men in his church who died from COVID-19. The deceased man's wife also tested positive and was forced to watch her husband's body lowered into the earth from a distance through a rolled up car window. It's not just New York. The whole country, the whole world is having to steward tens of thousands of heart-wrenching stories like this. And those of us who are so-called spiritual people, well, we have to decide what we're going to do with all of this. If you're like me, you're scanning the horizon, peering across 50,000 American corpses, and wondering if some of your cherished beliefs might now be obsolete. You're squinting for signs 
of the divine, but you feel like maybe God has pulled an Elvis and has left the building. Where is God when your world falls apart? Well, if you ask that question to Luke, the gospel writer, I think he'd tell you a story about a seven-mile stretch of road between Jerusalem and a town called Emmaus. Luke's story is one of seven post-resurrection narratives in the Gospels, but Luke is the only one to tell this particular tale, and like the other ones, well, it reads a little bit like a campfire ghost story. In his tale, it's been only three days. That's how long since Jesus was executed when Luke's story takes place. No one doubts whether he died, but some people now are spreading rumors that maybe this Jesus character has come back to life because someone said that someone said that he had been spotted, but who can know for sure? Even those who claimed to see Jesus had a difficult time believing their eyes. Every tale these eyewitnesses tell is about the same. Jesus appears in their midst, he says a little something, and then he just dissolves into the atmosphere. There's no proof that he actually showed up, so everybody has to decide for themselves whether they believe that Jesus is alive or not. It is, I think, the same question that so-called spiritual people, people like us, are still having to answer. Do we believe that Jesus actually came back to life? We haven't seen him. We haven't even talked to anybody who has seen him. We are so far down the line in this historical game of telephone that we wonder whether the message has maybe gotten garbled along the way. Well, if you struggle to believe, then you may feel some camaraderie with the two travelers in Luke's tale. They have surveyed the facts, and after looking at those facts, they've drawn the conclusion that Jesus is probably still dead. We know this because they have packed their bags and they are headed for home with grief hovering around their heads like a thundering squall line. Luke says that this road from Jerusalem to Emmaus is about seven miles long, which means it would take someone like you or I about two hours. Two hours. That's how long these two travelers had to discuss the events of those last three days, from the rigged trial to the sentence that did not nearly fit the crime, to the brutal execution that is so awful, neither one of these travelers will talk about it directly. There was also a tomb to consider, of course, and it was empty. But why? They can't say for sure. Either way, while they are discussing these disappointments, a stranger walks up and asks them why they look so glum. Apparently, this stranger doesn't get out much, and he's missed all of the good gossip about what's happened during the Passover celebration in Jerusalem. So the travelers tell him everything they know. They talk about Jesus, this prophet who taught them so much about God in such a countercultural way that the religious aristocracy convinced the Romans to kill him off before he stirred up a riot. Now, crucifixion is a traumatic thing to watch, especially when your friend is the one being executed. So the utter disappointment of the whole experience has convinced these travelers to end their Passover vacation a little early. With downturned faces, one of the travelers turns to the stranger and says, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Now hope, hope is something we could all use a little more of these days. But they said we had hoped he would save us. Can you think of a word in the English vocabulary that's sadder than hope in the past tense? I hoped she would recover. I hoped they'd let me keep my job. I hoped that my baby would be healthy. 
I hoped he would choose to stick it out, at least for the children's sake. It's amazing how desperate that four-letter word becomes when you just hook a tiny D to the end of it. That Jesus, they said, made us believe. That Jesus, they said, roused our spirits and sparked our imagination. But that Jesus, they said, was just a lie, a facade. Nothing, he said, turned out to be true. It's interesting to me that at this point in the narrative, Jesus is standing right in front of them, having a chit-chat with these two travelers who don't have the foggiest idea. The word that Luke uses in this passage indicates that the problem is not that the travelers did not see Jesus. The problem is that they didn't recognize him. I wonder. I wonder maybe if God is always present on the road called grief, waiting to be identified, waiting to be invited into the conversation. I wonder. I wonder if maybe we become so hyper-focused on our pain that we may see God, but we do not recognize God. I wonder if there are times when our eyes are open, but we are not observant. I wonder if there are times when we should be, but we aren't, scouting for signs of the sacred. And is it possible? Is it possible that the divine is all around us, even here in this moment, even in a global pandemic? But maybe we can be too busy kicking rocks and staring at the ground that we will not recognize it. This seems to be the problem with these two travelers in Luke's story. But it makes me wonder if this might be our problem too. Lucky for us, God doesn't stop speaking just because we're not paying attention. The stranger on the road that day hears their complaints, and he responds with something of a, of a Sunday school lesson. Haven't they read the prophets? Don't they know their history? The one who was to redeem Israel is not the one who strides to victory, but one who gets crushed by power and empire. As the stranger is speaking, a warmth forms just behind their sternums and spreads across their chests. And suddenly they wonder if maybe they should transform their past tense hoped back into its present form of hope again. It's too early to say. But as they enter Emmaus, they know they would like to keep the conversation going. Now, archaeologists have not been able to locate a village called Emmaus, not anywhere in this region, and there's no record of this town and other reputable sources, which is why some scholars have called it not just the road to Emmaus, but the road to nowhere. I'm less interested, as I read this story, though, in its physical geography. I'm more interested in the spiritual typology that Emmaus gives us. Because Emmaus is is not just a physical place. Emmaus is any place where you retreat to. Any place that you return to when your world falls apart. When your faith falls apart. For me, Emmaus can be retail therapy or mindless scrolling on my iPhone. It can be binging Netflix late into the night or an intimate encounter with a person who hasn't earned the right to that depth of intimacy. Emmaus is where we go to get rid of the emotions we don't want to feel, to shed the memories that we'd rather forget. The writer Frederick Beekner puts it this way. Emmaus can be a trip to the movies just for the sake of seeing a movie or to a cocktail party just for the sake of the cocktails. Emmaus may be buying a new suit or a new car or smoking more cigarettes than you really want or reading a second-rate novel or even writing one. Emmaus may be going to church on Sunday because Emmaus 
is whatever we do or wherever we go to make ourselves forget that the world holds nothing sacred, that even the wisest and bravest and loveliest decay and die. Well, when our travelers arrive at their Emmaus, they ask this strange man to stay just a little while longer, and so he enters their house, and he sits at their table, and then he oversteps his bounds. He's a guest, but he begins to act as if he is the host. He snatches the loaf of bread sitting in the middle of the table, and before they can bow their hands and say, let's pray, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he offers it. And then, and then something happens. The air in the room rearranges. Suddenly, the most marvelous sense of deja vu permeates that place. They've seen him before. They've seen this before, this pattern of taking and blessing and breaking and giving. This is the pattern that Jesus has repeated often throughout his ministry, from the feeding of the 5,000 to the Last Supper in the upper room. This is what Jesus does, breaks after he blesses and then offers it to us all. And just like that. These two travelers do not only see Jesus, they recognize him. And with sure hands, he extends the loaf to them, and they are so petrified, they can't even reach for it. And just like that, Jesus vanishes, and two half loaves of bread bounce off the tabletop. And that's the story's end. It's rather abrupt, really. There's no tearful, happy ending. There's no final punchline to leave us laughing, which makes the story feel all that more believable, if you ask me. You see, I think the road to Emmaus is not just about two travelers and a ghostly appearance. I think it's a story about the deep grief that we feel when God seemingly has let us down. It's a story about bumbling fools without enough awareness to recognize God standing right in front of them. It's a story about people who experience God almost like a ghost who comes and goes and not just when it's convenient. Which is to say... The road to Emmaus is a story about us all at one time or another. So I don't know what your grief looks like. I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what loss you're mourning. I don't know the depth of your disappointment. I don't know what you once hoped for or how you lost that hope along the way. But on my best days, on my very best days, I believe what Luke is trying to tell us. That we may walk the road of grief, but we never walk it alone. That even when we don't see God, God sees us. That the divine is always, ever, intersecting our lives, even when they've fallen apart, even when we're too forlorn to recognize it. So where is God when your world falls apart? Well, according to Luke, God is waiting in the friendship that you find with fellow grievers. God is waiting in the hospitality we extend to strangers. God is waiting in the ancient words, the good news in our sacred text. And God is waiting in the mysterious sacrament of breaking bread. So that's Luke's answer. It doesn't solve all of our problems, but it just might keep us going. 
It just might keep us hoping. It just might keep us walking. It just might keep us looking. And if we are brave enough to begin looking, to begin recognizing, who knows? Maybe when we stop to look deeper, maybe we'll find that the thing we once hoped for is standing right in our midst. Amen. Jonathan, thank you. And now having heard this reflection on our gospel text, we take a moment to declare our faith. And part of what that means is we express this Apostles' Creed, which is the most essential confession. It's the earliest and most primitive confession that we have that tells the story of Christ. And phrase by phrase, we have these sort of like ways to access this event. And so together, whether you have lots of faith or lots of doubt, let this be an act of solidarity. We're in this together. We are connected to this tradition. We're engaging it, wrestling with it, and we're trying to move it forward into the world in a way that is good news. So would you join me with this? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now having declared our faith, we also make space to offer our prayers. And so let's lift our hearts to God, holding our deepest desires, our deepest longings together in this city on behalf of our world. Good morning. This morning, we'd love to teach you this refrain for our prayers. O oh Christ, our good shepherd, Lord, would you hear our prayers? Break open our imaginations. Lord, would you hear our prayers? Christ, our Good Shepherd, we pray for your church as it walks the road of grief, processing the moment. Walk with us, O Lord. Offer us insight and courage in the midst of these troubling events. Break open our imaginations to love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Christ, our Good Shepherd, Lord, would you hear our prayers? Break open our imaginations. Lord, would you hear our prayers? Loving Creator, we pray for the world as we get our bearings on the coronavirus. We pray for the global economy. Inspire us toward a new normal. We pray for the most vulnerable countries and people. We ask for relief and care and that you'd inspire the helpers needed for the moment. We thank you for the relief our planet is feeling in this moment. Move us to take better care of it as stewards of your good world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sing Christ our Good Shepherd. Can we hear you sing? Christ our Good Shepherd, Lord, would you hear our prayer? Break open our imaginations. Lord, would you hear our prayers? Helper Spirit, we pray for our country and our city. Give wisdom to President Trump and his administration in this moment. Give our House and Senate a spirit of cooperation, poise, and service for the people. For New York, we pray for Governor Cuomo, Mayor de Blasio, all our medical frontliners, and all the people who are sick, hungry, and worried. 
We pray for the small business owners that they would have fresh entrepreneurial energy, courage to face the moment and the support they need to get back on their feet. Come alongside us, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. And now, having offered our prayers, we make space for confession. And thinking of our story today, I want us to consider confession and sin in the light of breaking and the cracks of our lives. Maybe something right now feels like it is being broken up in you, um, the way that tough soil is tilled. Maybe something has been totally broken open, or maybe you just feel the beginnings of cracks or pressure. And this is a moment to pay attention you know, what is sin if it's not simply mismanaged vulnerabilities? And so right now we, we focus in on our vulnerability and we take responsibility for the ways that we are mismanaging it, hiding it, withdrawing from it, not leaning into it. And so let's just take a moment to remember this past week and ask the question, where am I feeling the pressure? Where are the cracks? Where is the possibility for a breaking open where God's love can come in? and flood my heart and my life. And as we remember, we just simply invite you to relax. It's the kindness of God. It's the love of God that is the context for this practice. It's not the harsh, critical light of God, but it's the warm, inviting love of God. As these memories are coming to your mind, don't don't push them away. Don't repress them. Just simply let them be without judgment. Because in the light of Jesus' teaching, God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to give it life. And now, friends, we remember we're not alone. All the things that's co that are coming up to your mind right now, all the things that you're paying attention to, are similar and connected to the ways that we are remembering right now. And so together, let us make this corporate confession through this ancient prayer. Most merciful God, we confess that we've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we've left undone. We've not loved you with our whole hearts. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We're truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we would delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And now, friends, hear the good news of Jesus Christ, that you are loved as you are, that you are, in fact, the beloved, that at the core of your being, God sees you, knows you, and accepts you. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven and you are welcome. Amen. And now we come to this table and the reason we do so much preparation through you know, prayer and confession is because this table is about our connections with each other. It's about this union that we share with each other, with all of humanity, and with the good world that God created. And sin is simply the disconnection. It's the ways that we're torn apart or that we tear ourselves apart. And so as we come to this table, we come with that sense of responsibility for the ways that we're falling uh, short of love, for the ways that we're tearing this world apart and our connections apart. And we lean once again back into the loving um, connections that exist in our lives and the potential for love. And so would you join me in this prayer? Eucharist means good, uh, the great thanksgiving. And so as we come to this table, let's offer our thanks to God. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. God, it is good and beautiful to say thank you. And so right now we pause all over this city, all over this country, and some of us around the world, we pause to say thank you. Thank you for the good gifts of our lives, for the good gifts of our, our world, 
for these hidden gifts that exist in this moment of suffering and uh, of pain and of economic distress. We thank you for the little gifts. We thank you for the clean air that is emerging in our world right now. We thank you for um, the time that we are getting with one another, with you, with ourselves to reflect. And we just simply say thank you. And we cry out with the angels from Isaiah's vision who say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And now we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy word, that these gifts of bread and wine would become to us and for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who on the night he was betrayed took bread and cup and blessed them. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and he blessed it. And after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we welcome you, risen Christ. We thank you for this blood, which, or sorry, this body, which was given for the world. And we receive it afresh, this gift of your love, so that we might in turn offer it back to the world. And so we thank you and we love you. Amen. Likewise, the Lord Jesus took the cup and after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we welcome you risen Christ. We thank you for this blood, which speaks a better word than our violence, than all the ways that we try to manage our conflict, which lead to chaos and hurt and violence. We pray that you would give us the grace to receive what this blood points us to afresh, that you would grace us in this moment and give us the courage to receive forgiveness and to offer it in turn. We pray this in your name. Amen. And now friends, all around the, uh, the city and around the country and the world, we hold in our hands bread and cup or something like that. And as we hold these elements in our hands, let's remember our connection in the love of God that we see in Jesus Christ. And so I invite you, our practice is an open table. Um, whatever you bring to this, this uh, moment, whether it's lots of faith or lots of doubt, if you're drawn to the love we see in Jesus, let this practice, let this sacrament be a, a gesture of your open heart toward God, of your trust in what you see when you see Jesus. And so let us partake in this together. Our practice is intinction. So you take the bread and you dip it in the cup and you simply say, thanks be to God. Let's receive Holy Communion together. And now we declare the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen and Christ will come again. And these are God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. We're so glad that you've joined us once again. Uh, we want to put a reminder out to all of you. If you're interested in hosting uh, a digital small group, we'd love for you to let us know. You can email jeremy at goodshepherdnewyork.com and let him know. We're going to be organizing those over the coming weeks. And now receive this benediction. My brother, my sister, God love you and God bless you. My brother, my sister, God love you and God bless you. May God hold us all in those almighty hands of love. May God hold us all in those almighty hands of love Cause the world keeps spinning around Spinning around Yeah, the world keeps spinning around Spinning around Oh, can we ever learn to love each other?
Spin around. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Go in peace. The sun will rise, the sun will rise, bringing life to the earth as it springs from the ground. The sun will rise, the sun will rise, won't you try?